Hi, I'm Rich Mihar. Today, I want to talk about Arrow's impossibility theorem and how we get away from the impossibility. Arrow's theorem created a modern paradigm of social choice, which studies group choices. Social choice theory has had an impact on areas like ethics and political science, as well as economics. Today, computer scientists who design algorithms for ranking websites are running social choice. It's a theory that has wide application. Here's an outline. First, I give motivating examples. I introduce the notions like Waters' rule and the paradox of voting. Second, I describe the notion of aggregation rules and state the theorem. Finally, I explore several possible ways to escape from the impossibility. Okay, let's begin. Social choice deals with aggregation of the preferences of different people. Let's suppose there are five judges who want to choose a winner from three candidates, A, B, and C, for a beauty contest. Or preferably, they want to rank the three candidates. Individually, three judges have the preference CBA, which means that they rank candidate C first, B second, and A third. The other two judges have the preference BAC. There are many, there are many methods of aggregating the individual rankings or preferences. For example, the plurality voting just looks at the top alternative in each preference and picks the most popular one. It chooses candidate C because C gets three votes, B gets two, and A gets nothing. Another method is by Condorcet, an 18th century French guy. He didn't like the idea of ignoring the second and third alternatives in each preference. Instead, his, his method compares each pair of alternatives, A versus B, A versus C, and B versus C. In this case, since C beats A by the score of 3 to 2, and C beats B by 3 to 2, C is the clear winner. It's called the majority winner, or the Condorcet winner. Well, it looks like C is the right choice, is it? Another French guy, Borden, didn't like the plurality rule either. Let me describe his method, which is often used in contests like ours. When there are three alternatives, each voter reports his preference by giving two points to the first alternative in his preference, one point to the second, and zero to the third. Let's calculate the total score for each alternative. Look at alternative A. Since three voters rank A last, A gets three times zero points from them. Likewise, since two voters rank A second, a gets 2 times 1 points from them. So the total score for A is 2 points. Similarly, you can calculate the scores for B and C. Now, rank the alternatives according to the total scores. That gives the border ranking of B first, C second, A third. In particular, B, which gets the highest score, is the border winner. So despite the fact that, despite the fact that a majority prefers C to B, the border rule selects B. Condorcet would call that a serious drawback of Borders' rule. Maybe Condorcet's criticism would be appealing if there are always a majority winner, an alternative that beats everything else. But the paradox of voting shows that you can't always find a majority winner. Let me give you the simplest example of the paradox. Voter 1 has the preference A, B, C, so she prefers A to B, B to C, and A to C. Here, piece of 1 just denotes what's called Voter 1's strict preference. You can see other guys' preferences there. Now, let me indicate those preferences on the graph. Look at the arrow from A to B. It's labeled 1 and 3, since voters 1 and 3 prefer A to B, but voters 2 doesn't. I could have labeled the arrow from B to A, but I didn't, since that doesn't form a majority. Likewise, the thick arrows with labels indicate majority preferences. Now the result is a cycle of A beats B, B beats C, but C beats A. So for every alternative, there is a majority of voters who prefer another alternative. In other words, there's no maximal alternative. Examples so far suggest that aggregating individual preferences is not a simple matter. Arrow's theorem states that it is indeed difficult. The theorem is about aggregation rules. Just for exposition, let me assume for the moment that there are three alternatives and three individuals. Examples of alternatives include candidates in an election, government policies, and of course, the cats in a beauty contest. A preference aggregation rule translates each list of individual preferences into a consensus ranking. We often call such a list a profile of individual preferences. So the rule is a function whose inputs are profiles and whose outputs are often called group preferences. Those preferences are ordinary in the sense that they only indicate which alternative is better than which. They don't indicate how much one alternative is better than another. It's important to realize that an aggregation rule must give an output to every possible input, and there are a lot of inputs. Let me count them. Since there are three alternatives, each voter has six possible preferences. They are indicated there. If you want, you can allow ties. For example, a voter may be indifferent between A and B but prefer them to C, allowing ties as several more preferences. 
Since there are three voters each having six possible preferences, there are six to the third power profiles in total, that's 216 profiles. An aggregation rule must specify a group preference R for each of those 216 profiles. We allow a group preference R to be any of the 13, which include those having ties. Otherwise, the definition of an aggregation rule excludes important rules such as voters. How many rules are there? There are 216 inputs and 13 outputs, so you can see that there are a very large number of aggregation rules. But some of them are so terrible that you want to exclude them right away by imposing certain conditions. Examples may include the constant rule, which always chooses the same alternative regardless of the individual preferences. By imposing certain conditions on aggregation rules, you can rule out terrible ones. Since there are a very large number of rules, you might worry that you need to impose a lot of conditions in order to exclude everything but good rules. Arrow's theorem says, however, imposing just a few conditions will kill all possible rules. Okay, let me state the theorem. We assume there are at least three alternatives and two voters. Arrow's theorem says there's no aggregation rule that simultaneously satisfies the three conditions of unanimity, independence, and non-dictatorship. Unanimity requires that an alternative x that everybody prefers to another alternative y must be ranked above y. Pairwise independence requires that whether the group ranks x above y or y above x depends only on voters' preferences regarding x and y. Voters' preferences regarding other alternatives don't matter. Non-dictatorship rules are dictatorial rules which count only one particular voters' preferences and ignore the others. So you see, imposing just three conditions kills every rule and those conditions don't look particularly demanding. A striking result. You may wonder, what about those rules like majority of borders? Don't they satisfy the conditions? If so, stop this slide and read it, as well as the next one. How do we get away from ours impossibility? Let me comment on that very briefly. Along the way, I'll introduce you to my own related papers. First, I've implicitly assumed that there are only finite remaining voters. If there are infinite remaining individuals, there are aggregation rules satisfying our conditions. But the idea of infinite remaining people voting doesn't sound very realistic. Also, you can't actually carry out a computation from infinitely long data. So I gave a new interpretation of individuals and considered computability of aggregation rules. I showed that the rules satisfying our conditions violate computability. Second, you might say, why do we need to determine a group ranking when all we need is to choose a single alternative? That defines the notion of social choice function, which maps each profile into an alternative. Well, Gibbard's start of the theorem says that every non-dictatorial social choice rule can be manipulated by some voter. That means that by misrepresenting her preference, a voter can sometimes change the outcome better for her. My own papers related to the GS theorem consider the infinite voter framework and show that the social choice function that's immune to group manipulation only takes account of the top alternatives in preferences, just like plurality voting. Third, restricting the domain of admissible preferences is another way out of the impossibility. If you can arrange alternatives from left to right in one dimension and exclude preferences that have multiple peaks, then the median of the peaks behaves well. Unfortunately, in higher dimensional spaces, there's nothing corresponding to the median. First, I have assumed that a group preference is complete and transitive, though I avoided those javelins. But just for obtaining the best alternative for each finite set, it's enough to exclude cyclic preferences, the type of preferences that we saw in the voting paradox. An important result here states that in order to avoid cyclic group preferences, you have to restrict the number of alternatives to be less than a certain number called the Nakamura number of the rule. So to be able to deal with many alternatives rationally, you have to have a large Nakamura number. Kumabe and I explore conditions for that. Since the Nakamura number of majority rule is 3, his theorem suggests that majority rule can deal with up to two alternatives rationally. So let me take up the case of two alternatives separately. May's theorem says that simple majority rule is the only aggregation rule that satisfies anonymity, neutrality, and monotonicity. Anonymity requires equal treatment of voters, and neutrality requires equal treatment of alternatives. I have papers exploring anonymity and neutrality without restricting the number of alternatives. Well, that's all. Don't forget to check my website.